Whenever you're ready. Commonplace 
and inherent. And regarding them as things that are just not that, their natural belonging, embodiment, and the human. Um, I want to try to some three things. So how belonging is contested through the lens of spiritual possession, the notion of being embodied, and how it is described <coughs> by the author. And I'm just realizing um, I've listed it backwards, but I'll be sure to take note. And how the novel regards madness. In my discussion, I've opted to look for some particular parts of the novel that are concerned with the Addis human birth and her childhood, the Obanjo's first birth, and a personal essay written by the author, Apake Nezi, about their um, experience of um, getting their gender affirmation surgeries. So the first theme, belonging to nation state or ethnic group. Relationships with spirits or being embodied as the spirits, black and fresh water, constantly calls into question what belonging means. Scholars that argue belonging to God will always call upon the subject to divest from the family structure. They cannot coexist. And this way belonging to a God and being vested in them is described as a form of antisociality. The other is better to live this way, as the novel explains how her being evil, for instance, is done intentionally for the other's kin and God to create that direct link. The Nigerian father is only a conduit for facilitating that connection. Belonging to the family is, the own, is only as necessary in as much as it brings the other, the other closer to her birth mother, Ella. To further cement this opaqueness or non-transparency of this logic, we the readers and the narrator do not know why it happened this way. All we know is that an evil man made a prayer, and to quote, sometimes the only God who hears a prayer is the one who intends to answer it. So Ella sent her children out of her womb world into the earthly realm, into a liminal in-between that spirits as the Adda fumble through. However, not strictly belonging to the human family does not negate the potential for violence that is often characterized as the necessary patriarchal hand that rocks the cradle, protects the family, etc. Being the children of a minor God does not grant any protections against trauma in the second human life either. Indeed, it is a father, it's the Adda's father who very literally severs her slash their connection to their birthplace when their mother, who is referred to as the Adda, visits a child in the form of a python. And the way she describes it is that she's three years old in a bathroom and she encounters a python staring up at her and not recognizing it through her human eyes, screams. Um, and I just want to read the passage in when in which the father <coughs> comes upon this. Now Saul was a modern evil man. His medical training had been on his scholarship in the Soviet Union, after which he spent many years in London. He did not believe in mumble jumbo, anything that would have said a snake could mean anything other than death. When he saw the other, his baby, with tears dripping down her face, blubbering in terror at a python, a wintered fear clutched at his heart. He snatched her up and away, took a machete, went back, and hacked the python to bits. Allah, our mother, dissolved amid broken scales and pieces of flesh. She went back. She would not return. So was angry. It was an emotion that felt comfortable, like worn in slippers. Um, so that can be read in one instance as a father protecting their young child, who screams in, ter um, in terror at the sight of something unknown to her in this form, as human, as a small child, becomes the first instance of their mother being taken from them. Later at the end of the chapter, the narrator explains, as if this is the fate of an Obanje child, which goes, and this is how you break a child, you know. Step one, take the mother away. The staging of this scene, that is, describing the literal sight of the human child, but also describing through the eyes of the Obanje, undermines the assumed ubiquity of the patrilineal line and the significance of the paternal figure, and through that belonging to a paternalistic state. In undermining it, the staging deliberately exposes how belonging in this way may be superfluous, and how belonging can doubly afford protection, but through acts of violence that come along with being protected. Um, Obanjo in particular can be described as antisocial. They have been born into a human infant is said to be forced as a contract of living, leaving the realm from which they are initially born with the promise of return. Although not explicit, this is often to the disgruntlement of the spirit's kin. 
Similarly, Obanja that are born as children are often framed as liter in literature as domestic terrors of Igbo families, and they're determined as to be the cause of grief in the cycle of life and genealogy and ancestry. A popular depiction or example of this is um, before fresh water is um, seen in Chinua a seminal novel, Things Fall Apart. The daughter of the main character, Gongo, whose name is Azima, like the other, is both considered especially precious, a child that was prayed for, and is seen to trouble the commonplaceness of the society around her. Indeed, her father is proud of her headstrong character and her intelligence, but in her stiff masculinity, sees it as a waste because she won't grow into a man. And let things fall apart though. Freshwater deals with the interior life of Enobanje, resituating this discussion on the terror sought by such spirits, which brings me to my next scene, the body, which um, I want to open with a quote that um, Amezi said somewhere, that to be embodied in the first place is the first act of violent mutilation. The body is superfluous, but remains a significant site in, a, in the way that it's malleable, it's more so a receptacle for navigating this earthly realm. Um, just for time, um, I'll just describe how the Obanja are described as having to place or hide themselves in something earthly. And the way that the Obanja in um, Freshwater do it is that they say they hide themselves in her muscles and between her bones, that the way her body is fractured, they can hide themselves in those pieces of her. And if and they say that if they wanted to take her, they had to take the body. Um, and again, <coughs> being the child of a minor god still does not negate these violence. Having this oath tied into their body still does not negate this violence. And um, sorry, I'm in five minutes. Then. Um, Oh, how much time do I have? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, as stated above, being the child of a minor god who allowed her progeny to enter this realm doesn't spare the other from further harm. In the novel, we see her treated violently. In fact, their third book becomes Asugaru's emergence as the primary narrator in the aftermath of a traumatic sexual assault. Um, in this way, I want to consider how offering this reading as a way of thinking about a post humanist approach. Um, we can't assume forms of transcendentalism that negate figures like the Adda, survivors who refuse being easily defined and often shoulder the consequences of others' insistence that they do. Rather, what I hope to do in this reading is to articulate how I'm being situated as in between, that even within the liminality, though these varying feelings of being ambivalent, confused, or even repulsed in their observations, the Adda's or Banje, narrating their experiences to the reader, giving insights into their interior life, develops the discursive practice of disbelonging and resenting embodiment. Um, and in my introduction, I discussed like, this thing of matter and physical matter like, of the body. And what especially interested me in fresh water was its animative capacity. And this is to say what being as matter does and ways we attempt to explain its doing. And in this section, I want to discuss um, a personal essay written by Fabian Mezzi about their experience of getting gender affirmation surgery. And this experience is overlap with the realization of um, being an Obanjian. In describing um, responses of others to their intentions to get gender affirmation surgery, which included a hysterectomy, which is the removal of the uterus and um, all the female reproductive organs, um, and as he describes views that although they emerge from various locations, but are ultimately deeply colonial, deeply um, Christian, and very much rooted in eugenics, are revolved and confused by them. So the first example is a, doc a surgeon who says, I've never heard of anyone like this. It was an old white man who had performed many surgeries on trans patients, from breast augmentations to double mastectomies. Male to female, female to male, fine. But this in-between thing? And the second vignette is um, Messi considering how Nigerians would respond. And we read, still there was a deep sense of transgression about what I was doing that I couldn't shake. 
especially as a Nigerian, it was too easy to tune into our communities and hear the voices heavy with disgust, saying that what I had done was disfiguring, that God had made me one way for a reason, and that I had no right to say or do otherwise, that I was mutilating myself. There was an ideal my body was supposed to conform to, and I was deviating it from it by having surgery. I was rejecting it as a center and choosing something else, a world where the deviation itself was the ideal. I choose it readily. I've never minded being a mutilated thing. In the same essay, Messi poses the question of whether the term like gender dysphoria can be used to describe the dysphoric state of Bengal Banjay and passing as human, let alone passing as a woman, which implicitly um, means being fated for other human things, being the wife of a man, <coughs> etc. One conclusion they reach in the essay reads, gender is, after all, such a human thing. So how do you reconfigure this relation? And how do you figure it through um, the idea that, um, as I said, of um, being a mutilated thing, mutilating oneself by choice, <coughs> by being an in-between thing, to quote the doctor. And one conclusion, or later in the essay, as he says that, being transgender means being any gender different from the one assigned to you at birth. Whether or banjo are a gender themselves, or without gender, it doesn't really matter. It still counts as a distinct category. So maybe my transition wasn't located within the human categories at all. Instead, the surgeries were a bridge across realities, a movement from being assigned female to assigning myself as a banjo, a spirit customizing its vessel to reflect its nature. So in considering Leslie's question whilst placing the pathology of the adder's own difficulties in fresh water and making sense of themselves or selves, and the pathologies of Western studies of possession, particularly in anthropology and psychology, I believe this question calls upon the reader to consider how they end up attempting to explain the, these experiences of fractured within systems that try to explain these ways of being as linear and easy to resolve. Fresh water in its staging time and time again reveals that it's not. Fresh Water does what Sharon P. Holland describes as the effect of the biography, which are transforming community into something that is not and never has been, a solid, viable, and working structure for the articulation of the self. Be it the Adda, Asugara, and St. Vincent's non-standing exile from the world womb of their mother, or the perpetual impermanence of the Lumiere, this practice of biomethography reads as a practice without conclusion and a life with no real end. In my own conclusion in this reading, I don't assume biomethography as a prescriptive practice or the narrative of fresh water as a prescriptive way of being. Rather, I try to think through what we can learn from this character's practice of understanding themselves, and by extension of that, recognizing oneself, what they need and require, to not just survive or to be seen by another, but to be cared for and self-assured. What ways of being can we make that what ways of being can we make or create that go beyond, move beyond the ideals of a best life, to say, in the world that we occupy now? Thank you. Hi, my name is Saleze. I will be speaking about a story by Bessie Head called The Collector of Treasures. It's, called, it's about black women in decolonization. Um, using Bessie Head's short story, The Collector of Treasures, this paper will examine the ways in which it foregrounds the lived experience of black women at the moment of decolonization through Digalevi, her main character. Using this character, Head highlights the ways in which black women work around patriarchal systems in order to carve out a space of their own. Drawing on Susan Andrade's gender in the public sphere in Africa, writing women and writing women, I will argue that Digalevi's murder of her husband is an act of protest against patriarchal systems as is Head's ability to write about this act in a way that neither judges nor condemns to get any. As fiction is an important means by which African women writers contest legacies of imperial and male dominance. To begin my discussion of the collector of treasures, I will quote Bessie Head at some length as she describes men in her lead up to talking about to get Lady's husband, Harasa Homokopi. She says, there were really only two kinds of men in the society. The one kind created such misery and chaos that it could be broadly, broadly damned as evil. 
that kind of man lived near the animal level and behaved just the same. Like the doll, dogs and dolls and donkeys, he also accepted no responsibility for the young he procreated. And like the dogs and the bulls and the donkeys, he also made females abort. Since that kind of man was in the majority in the society, he needed a little analyzing, as he was responsible for the complete breakdown of family life. He could be analyzed over three time spans. In the old days, before the colonial invasion of Africa, he was a man who lived by the traditions and taboos outlined for all the people, by the forefather of the tribe. He had little individual freedom to assess whether these traditions were compassionate or not. They demanded that he comply and obey the rules without thought. But when the laws of the ancestors are examined, they appear on the whole to have been vast, eternal disciplines for the good of society as a whole, with little attention given to individual preferences and needs. The ancestors made so many errors, and one of the most bitter-making things was that they relegated men, they relegated to men a superior position in the tribe, while women were regarded, in a congenital sense, as being an inferior form of human life. Independence suddenly and dramatically changed the pattern of colonial subservience. More jobs became available under the new government's localization program, and salaries skyrocketed at the same time. It provided the first occasion for family life of a new order, above the childlike discipline of custom, the degradation of colonialism. Men and women, in order to survive, had to turn inwards to their own resources. It was a man who arrived at this turning point, a broken wreck with no inner resources at all. One such man was Harasa Mokobi, the husband of Tigelini. Even during his lean days, he had a taste for womanizing and drink. Now he had the resources for a real spree. He left his wife and three sons. Although she seems to be talking about men in this extract, implicit in his writing is the victimization of women by these kinds of men. Through giving this history, Head shows that Tigelini is a victim of a man who prides himself on being an emancipated African but whose emancipation really takes the form of a destructive individualism that violates his community's traditional values, as Lloyd Brown argues. By li leaving his wife and sons, Haraseho is well against even the cultural norms which head questions, as she says that they relegate women to being an inferior form of human life, needing, therefore, what Leonette calls a lucid and self-reflexive critique of tradition carried out from within, by the culture, with, within the culture by those best acquainted with it which will highlight the structural dissymmetry that runs through and conditions the entire life of social and individual life. Harasefo can be described as what Loretta Novo calls a cowboy father, who only calls when he can. Um, he leaves his wife and kids, and Tikaledi is left to fend for them, uh, while Harasefo enjoys his spree. By giving this history, that is also highlighting the literal allegorical re relations between private and public structures and forms of power, which requires an understanding of the necessary implication of the domestic and the public. Head's history of the family and men's roles in the family point towards a recognition of the fact that the domestic sphere is a microcosm of the public sphere, and that the power relations implicit in both these spheres cannot be neglected. Leonette agrees stating that although the wide-ranging psychological and political problems resulting from colonialism are also invoked, the principal focus remains on sexual, familial, and domestic structures that uphold a particularly coercive order. <coughs> Head's narrator speculates that perhaps Harasafo behaves in the way that he does towards Tikaledi because he thinks that she is the boring, semi-literate, traditional sort, and there are lots of exciting new women around. Through the statement, and through his history of familiar relations through the ages, we again understand that concerns in the domestic sphere cannot be separated from national concerns and the power dynamics implicit in these, such as the question of literacy in newly independent African countries, and that in discourses surrounding female empowerment, Rockwell asserts that what is totally absent from consideration is empowerment in the so-called private sphere of the home, including family, sexual, and male-female relations. Tigeledi's murder of her husband is a testament to this, as not only is it an act of protest against patriarchal structures, which continue to render her an inferior form of human life, it is also an act of desperation, which portrays the fact that it is not possible to insulate special discursive arenas from the effects of social inequality. The societal inequality persists. Deliberative processes in public spheres will tend to operate to the advantage of dominant groups and to the disadvantage of subordinates, as Fraser argues. <coughs> For leaving his family, Harasef was very likely condemned by the community, showing that men feel at ease in the, public, in the public in a way that women do not. 
for murdering her husband, whose philandering ways and disrespect towards Tikaledi are well known, Tikaledi is sent to prison, and we are told that she had experienced such treasure, such terror during the awaiting trial period that she looked more like a skeleton than a human being. Tikaledi is ha heavily sanctioned for her actions, and she has taken out of the domestic sphere in Bulen, where she has been able to collect the treasures which make her life joyful, into the public sphere that is the legal system in Khabarone, which meets our punishment without any due consideration of what she has suffered at the hands of her husband. Scattered over what Leonette calls a, ge a ge geography of pain are Tikaledi's treasures, which are the people and things she has collected that give meaning to her life, despite her manifold oppression. One of these is a friendship with Ginalek, who becomes Tikaledi's neighbor in Bulen, with whom she has one of those deep, affectionate, sharing everything kind of friendships that only women know how to have. The Galeri story highlights Rockhill's assertion that because it is caught up in the power dynamic between men and women, literacy is lived as women's work, but not as women's rights. Women yearn to become literate, to go to school, but are confined to the home. Confined to the home, the Galeri has to find other avenues for pleasure. The children, like her relationship with Ganalek, are another of her treasures. She says, I am satisfied I have children. They are a blessing to me. To which Ginalepa replies, oh, it isn't enough. Um, Ginalepa is highlighting the splendid isolation of motherhood without sexual fulfillment, as we are told that Tigaledi never really cared for sex. She elaborates and says, I mean, it was just jump on and jump off, and I used to wonder what it was all about. I developed a dislike for it. The fact that Tigaledi has children does not mean that she enjoyed the sex that preceded them, and this is important in that, like the ways in which women live illiteracy, the way women live sexual oppression is integrally connected to the ways they live class and ethnicity. These are not experienced as a series of climatized background variables, but they are lived together in the mosaic of people's lives. Another one of Tikaledi's treasures is her work, and she is quite proud of it. Despite being semi-literate and barely educated, Tikaledi is able to support herself and her sons after Kharasako leaves them. Rock Hill states that the range of work options open to women is much more limited, and the, including their access to any form of capital. Despite this, Tikaledi manages to build up a thriving business, and we are told that she has soft, caressing, almost boneless hands of strange power, work of a beautiful design that grew from those hands. Tikaledi's treasures highlight the fact that Tikaledi is aware of her oppression and still finds ways to live a life of meaning, and this does not change when she is sent to prison. In the beginning of the story, we are not told her name until it is read from her file by a prison attendant. And instead, she is turned to the prisoner. Head writes, the everyday world of plowed fields, grazing cattle, and vast expanses of bush and forest seemed indifferent to the hungry eyes of the prisoner who gazed out at them through the wire mesh grating at the back of the police truck. At some point during the journey, the prisoner seemed to strike at some ultimate source of pain and loneliness within her being, and overcome by it, she slowly crumples forward in a wasted heap, oblivious to everything but her, but her pain. She is almost dehumanized in her pain, showing that the murder of her husband, although an act of both desperation and protest, comes at great personal cost. She has lost the impossibly rich and happy life that enables her to look past the barrenness of her own life. And she has also lost access to her children and Gidalegu, who form part of her treasures. Speaking about murder as an act of protest, Leonette says, for whereas murder is generally considered to be a crime of the individual against the state, in this text, it is present as a symptom of society's crime against the female individual. Struggle for the control of their own bodies determines the ultimate act of resistance. Indeed, the fact that Tikaledi finds a community of women in prison who have also murdered their husbands testifies to this. When she arrives in prison, the warder on duty said, says, So you have killed your husband, have you? You will be in good company. There are four other women here for the same crime. It's becoming quite the fashion these days. <laughs> Shortly after her arrival, Tikaledi has the following conversation with Gibonye, a fellow prisoner. Gibonye asks, and what may your crime be? And Tikaledi replies, I have killed my husband. And Gibonye says, we are all here for the same crime. And then she asks, do you feel any sorrow about the crime? Tikaledi replies, not really. Um, Gibonye asks, how did you kill him? Uh, I cut off his special parts with a knife. Gibonye says, I did it with a razor. I have had a troubled life. It is no coincidence that all the women who have killed their husbands are put in the same cell. The nature of their protest, which is interpreted by the legal system as a crime, sets them apart. 
By the water saying that women killing their husbands is becoming quite the fashion these days. She is linking these murders to the moment of decolonization, and the acts of these women show that their lived experience are in extreme opposition to the supposed emancipation that decolonization brings, highlighting the calculated, either subdued or explosive violence that has been the mark of domestic life. Therefore, what we are seeing is theory being constructed in sites which are traditionally under white supremacist capitalist patriarchal logic, assumed to be outside the terrain of knowledge making. As Gola says, revolutionary theory and emancipatory politics that fall outside the purview of patriarchal structures and actively seek to destroy these structures. By talking so openly about murdering their husbands, these women are fostering a sense of community that arises from a shared sense of oppression, yes, but also a shared sense of resistance. Tigeledi's new friend Kibonia says to her during her first day in jail, we must help each other. This is a terrible world. There is only misery here. It is after the statement that the narrator says, and so the woman Tigeledi began phase three of a life that had been ashen in its loneliness and unhappiness, and yet she had always found gold in its ash, deep loves that had joined her heart to the hearts of others. She smiled tenderly at Kibonia because she knew already that she had found another such love. She was a collector of such treasures. Thus, we see that far from being an isolating experience, prison becomes for Tigeledi what Frazier, Coton and Andrade called alternative publics or subaltern publics, which are parallel discursive arenas where oppressed people invent and circulate counter discourses, which in turn permit them to formulate oppositional interpretations of their identities, interests, and needs. Prison, intended to be a place of punishment for Tigeledi, becomes instead a subaltern public, where she is among people with a shared interest in actively resisting patriarchal structures. Leonet asserts that the workings of the legal system are not made visible in this story, as though the female defendant is completely invisible to the justice system. system. In prison, Tigeledi is visible again, among a community of women who understand her oppression and share in her suffering. Thus, she begins phase three of her life, where she continues to collect treasures despite the oppressive system she inhabits. She enters a subaltern public, which could also be described as a certain utopi utopian female community found in the other spaces, the heterotopias of the protagonist world, among other female inmate victims, like to get any of criminal procedures that attribute guilt unjustly. After Tigeledi kills her husband, she has the following conversation with her sons with her son. Mother, he said in a terrified whisper, didn't I hear father cry? And she replies, I have killed him, waving her hand in the air with a gesture that said, well, that's that. Then she added sharply, go and call the police. This, um, it is interesting to note that she kills him by severing his manhood, during which she also severs the artery which runs on the inside of the, of the groin. Through the very symbolic act of cutting off his penis, Tigeledi is staging a powerful embodied protest against the patriarchal structures which have conspired to oppress her, her husband being emblematic of these structures. Leonet argues that, though victimized by patriarchal so social structures that perpetuate that invisibility and de dehumanization, black female characters actively resist their objectivi objectification to the point of committing murder. <coughs> Seen in the slides, murder is not necessarily a crime, but an act of resistance against the perpetual victimization at the hands of men that has characterized Tigeledi's life. Tigeledi's killing of her husband occurs at the moment of de de decolonization, thereby lending credence to Andrade's assertion that women's culture and politics were often understood as unrelated to nationalism and therefore is not engaged in the larger political process. The fact that Tigeledi kills her husband at, the, at this particular moment is not a coincidence. Frazier's notion of subaltern publics is a useful lens to, through which to view Tigeledi's actions, in that it helps us understand that the ways in which women and men enter nationalist conversations are vastly different. Contrary to the emancipation that decolonization supposedly brings, we see Tigeledi being continually oppressed. We therefore understand that freedom and emancipation mean very different things for men and women. Um, for men, it may be enough to have thrown off the yoke of colonization. However, women still feel their oppression at the hands of men keenly. Part of this oppression is the denial of women's right to education. Tigeledi only married Harasekho at the behest of her uncle, who had stopped paying her school fees. 
This shows how the provision of opportunities to overcome literacy is seen essential to the liberty of the individual as well as the nation. As there is a dominant ideology which constructs vast numbers of people as illiterates, thereby rendering them powerless. The fact that Tikeleli tells her son to call the police shows that she has no illusions about the fate of women who take action to save themselves. Tikeleli's treasures are the people and things that she has collected around herself to offset her oppression. <coughs> Offset only because it always lingers, either in the form of her husband or in the form of the prison system. Her ability to collect these treasures raises questions about the woman as victim and suggests the possibilities of new relationships in her society. Although Tikeledi feels her victimization, her treasures show that she also refuses to be a victim, and her most vocal emancipatory act is to kill her husband. Although this is rendered a crime by the justice system, it should be viewed as a powerful act of protest against patriarchal structures. Thank you. My name is Mkhopile Mbuloi. Um, I'll be talking about um, a project that I'm working on. So it's still a work in progress, and I think that will be reflected in some of the ideas that I have, that they'll be quite fragmented and not necessarily resolved. Go, navigate from Gauteng, Park Station via Jorison Street towards the University. Coordinates 26 degrees 11 minutes 50 seconds south, 28 degrees 2 minutes 31 seconds east. Destination, Wirtz Arts Museum, 25 degrees 34 minutes 19 seconds south, 31 degrees 10 minutes 53 seconds east. Time, 11 a.m. Travel time, 16 minutes. Feelings, slight discomfort, mood, alert. Perceived frequency, rapid motion. Tactics, walk at a steady pace. Do not make eye contact. If, wait, when you get provoked, keep moving. When you get attacked, do not yell rape, yell fire. Allies, other women and children. Points of safety, intersections where there's enough foot traffic, hair salons where there are plenty of other women, Grocery shops and general stores where there are families, women, and school children. Riavaya bus stop where there are students, particularly female students, because male students are also predators. Mm -hmm. Strategy, be both visible and invisible. Mm -hmm. Time at destination, 11.16 a.m. Feeling, relief. Mood, relaxed. Frequency, largely slow. The theme for this conference is theorizing from the epicenters of our agency. And in terms of my positionality, we specifically refer to women, and even more specifically women of color. But how can we speak of agency, this power for my thoughts and my actions to shape my own experiences, when I know very well that my safety, no, actually my life, is at the mercy of irrational predators who rape and murder women. We know about Naledi Litaba, Garabu Mukwena, Riva Stienkamp, Notkolok, Katkeka, and Uyanene Mretwana. But of course, we also know that these are not isolated incidents. We know about these stories, but there are many more that are unrecorded and unspoken about. I guess with this research project, what I'm trying to do is trying to think through decoloniality and feminist theory as a way to prob problematize <laughs> oppressive regimes of normal in relation to how women move. And I quite like um, Carol Bates' um, quote where she says, one can think of the personal and bodily experiences as a source of authoritative knowledge and gen um, generating impartial insights. So I'm thinking about how my own experiences as a woman of color or as a black woman walking down um, through the city can begin to generate new ways of thinking about how women experience space. I'm investigating and theorizing on the movement of women in urban landscapes, interrogating the politics of gender and sexuality as it relates to that movement. I'm asking the questions, who feels safe in the city and why? Who's allowed to walk the streets of Johannesburg and under what conditions? Where and when do women feel safe? 
and how does being a woman negatively affect my experience of navigating the city? As a student um, within the curatorial practice program, my research is interdisciplinary. So a lot of it is centered around um, curatorial practice, but I'm also engaging visual arts, obviously, and literature. I'm thinking about um, Vaughan's work, which she uh, wrote in 1992, The Fight for Control of Women's Mobility in um, Colonial Zimbabwe. Vaughan's work is useful in thinking through how women have committed and continue to resist and find ways of working um, past and through restrictions of mobility um, around cities. I'm also thinking about Panache Chigumadzi's um, recent article um, titled Voices as Powerful as Guns, where she's speaking about Dorothy Masuka's um, rioting and her pan-Africanism. Chigumadzi presents two realities and conditions for the African woman. The first one is the reality of the African woman who has been left behind. This African woman is um, considered to be inherently debased, temperate, and hindrance to African progress because she perpetually holds on to African cultural traditions described by um, settlers as um, kind of being obscuring progress. The second reality that I'm looking at is um, that of the African woman who travels to the city in search of work and independence. And this type of woman has been labeled the traveling native prostitute, also just kind of reminding us of the power of language as a way to silence people. I'm also engaging Dr. Matsipa's work on present representation in the city. Uh, Matsipa is concerned with our representation of the black body, how it's usually represented as um, uncivilized and crudely sexual. She goes deeper by making a further distinction in relation to how black women are represented. Uh, so these variations, so I'm just going to leave that point because <laughs> I've lost my way. Um, and I guess what I'm also trying to talk about in terms of this movement is that I realize that there's a difference between mobility regarding material struggles where women are moving between one place to the other in order to find work, for example, but also um, informal type of movement where women are moving from one place to the other on a temporary basis. So that could mean that you're walking to school or you're going to grab a drink or you are going um, to work and so on. And so what I'd like to do is to look at an archive that already exists. Some of you might um, know of this archive. Creepy Daughters of District 6 as a methodology, but also as a case study to try and think about how through art history, different types of women have navigated um, urban landscape. So just to make a disclaimer here, that when I talk about women, I specifically put an X and not women with an E. Um, and that's because I'm going beyond the definitions of women as female. Understanding that some women do self-describe and self-identify as women, and that's why Quippy's um, case study is not only relevant but also interesting as someone who is or was um, putting her own self um, to be read in this way as a woman. Okay, so I'm going to go into the case study now. Seven women face the camera, four of them sitting, the rest standing. Olivia, Creepy, Patty, Sue Thompson, Brigitte, Gaia, and Missy. They uninhibited and exude a sense of ease, playfulness, and freedom. This image is taken in the middle of Selawi Road in Cape Town. We can see pink pants, pink hair, oversized sunglasses. It's choreographed, and we can see that the women are not caught off guard. These are the daughters of District 6 always glamorous and always beautiful. This particular image is one of over 700 images that were donated by Quipi to the Gala Archives in 1995. 
what would become um, to be known as the Creepy Project. Creepy, who was born Eugene Malcolm Fritz, was a celebrated queer icon who lived and worked in, in Cape Town's District 6 before the apartheid government forcibly removed residents from the Cape Flats. Although Creepy was born male, she traversed and blurred the lines between men and women, complicating gender bin binaries, perhaps seeing heteronormativity and strict definitions of identity as a trap. She was often quoted as declaring, I'm naturally just me. People can't say I'm a man, they can't say I'm a woman. The Creepy Collection birthed a photographic exhibition called Creepy Daughters of District 6, initially staged in Cape Town between September 2018 and January 29, with a second iteration happening at the Market for the Workshop, which some of you might have um, been able to go see. My interest in this collection of photographic images stems from my curiosity of narratives of mobility, how different women experience space and how different women navigate through that space. So as I'm going through the archive, I'm asking myself, what can Creepy tell us, or rather, what can the collection tell us about how different bodies experience space? Mm -hmm. And so just to clarify that Creepy is not necessarily to stand in for all women, but um, just kind of presents one form of a certain body navigating through space. As a young black woman living in Johannesburg, a city with pervasive rape culture and one of the highest rates and worst cases of violence against women, children, and queer bodies, this question of mobility, the ability to move freely and easily across the city is constantly on my mind. So upon engaging with this archive and reflecting on the nuanced moments of Creepy's life through these images, I started to notice that she had a certain relationship with space. I began to re reflect on that um, relationship and how she negotiated her movement. Um, throughout the collection, sorry, <laughs> um, everything's a little bit difficult because I'm just recovering from like a hectic flu, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, throughout the collection, we see again and again images that suggest playfulness and lightheartedness, and we see that Creepy and her friends are constantly flirting with glamour, attractiveness, and desirability. This depiction of glamour, attractiveness, and desirability can be seen as a tool that is deliberate and um, deliberately used by Creepy, choosing how they want to present themselves, but also choosing how they wish to be seen. They, were, they would often refer to themselves as sisters or girls, uh, naming themselves after famous Hollywood actors and singers, such as Piper Laurie, Leslie Caron, Sue, Sue Thompson, Julie Andrews, and Doris Day. Ruth um, Ramsden Carlson, who is doing a PhD on the collection, expressed this as using photography as a broader, as part of a broader practice of reimagining themselves as glamorous and desirable. So this pursuit of glamour and desirability might at first glance seem frivolous. However, when we begin to consider identity politics and politics of beauty, we are reminded of how power is entangled with notions of beauty. We are reminded of how millions of people who do not conform to mainstream standards are sidelined and rendered unseeable, unsafe, and unworthy. It then becomes clear how accessing glamour and attractiveness can become acts of resistance, but also strategies for survival. Obviously, these strategies are not without their own complexities, as they might be read through the eyes of um, politics of respectability, so the extent to which marginalized groups will self-police their own behavior and appearance in order to conform to the dominant culture. And so as I'm thinking through this question of who is seen and how they are seen and how that translates into how they move through the world, I'm reminded of Professor Cezanele Muholi's sentiments that were captured in a documentary, um, Art 21. Um, Muholi, uh, Muholi expresses that there are a lot of beautiful humans out there who get to be on the cover of magazines and they love dearly. 
Why are ordinary people only featured in magazines when there's a tragedy? Why are there no images of queer people, especially black queer people, and yet we are told that we have a right to be, and that we're also told that we have a right to exist? And so there's a risk here that I can begin to over-theorize the creepy collection, reading into images what was never intended by its author, since Creepy died before the collection could be made um, public. But I think that if we look through the collection um, in a way that is respectful, but also being cognizant of um, like the possibility of misinterpretations and mistranslations, then we can draw out some themes and be able to reflect our own experiences on the collection. I personally found it interesting how Creepy chose to caption each of the images before she handed them over to Gala. So these gestures and their particularity in terms of how she's consistent on two points. So number one, she's consistent on names. Each and every um, image has a specific name of who is captured in the image. And number two, she's very cons consistent around where the image was taken, speaking to the idea of location. Um, so this then, this then created a space for me to reflect on the idea of spatial freedom, how creepy was moving through space. As you can imagine, moving around the city as a queer body between 1950s and 1980s would not have been easy even in the self-proclaimed gay capital of Cape Town. And yet, Creepy and her sisters seem to be challenging the, um, this notion. So through the handwritten captions, I've been able to create a mapping of sorts. And from we see um, some of the images taken are quite intimate in like bedrooms and living rooms and kitchens and backyards. But we also see that some of them have been taken in streets, hotel clubs, and parks. There was creepy existing and being. So some of the examples, creepy in her bedroom preparing to go to a party, creepy and brigade in Andrew Place, creepy in Rodger Street, creepy at the Trafalgar Box, <coughs> creepy and Samantha in Kensington, creepy at the Queen's Hotel, creepy and Selawi Road, creepy and Brian at Fourth Beach, Creepy at the Spanish night at, a, um, at the Ambassador Club. Cre creepy at um, Cogles Bay. Creepy at Bob's scene um, in Kensington Inn. Creepy on a neighbor's stoop in Francis Street. Brian, Creepy and Samantha at a party in De Schmidt Street. Creepy in Newmarket Street. And this is my favorite. Creepy sitting on a radio with blue here in Radka Street after a six week holiday in Durban with Samantha and Gertrude. In um, a cartography of invisible lives, um, Francois Verges writes um, the following quote, behind the scenes of, of official history and geography stands a series of hidden, marginalized and forgotten narratives these are maps of precarious, disposable lives. It is this idea of hidden narratives and hidden maps of di disposable lives that necessitates a new way of mapping. So Creepy's handwritten notes act as an intentional and detailed record of space and location. They start to create an overlapping and intermingled map of memories lived, of songs sung, of meals shared and stories told. These maps tear through the old lines drawn by an evil government which wanted to separate people based on the color of their skin. They also tear through invisible lines dictating where women's bodies can be. They also to, uh, tear through notions of safe and non-safe spaces that often um, limit women's ability to move freely. These are new maps of possibility, new maps of mobility, and new maps of freedom. Thank you. Are there any questions from the floor, please?
We have actually a lot of time because uh, one speaker could not make it, so we are not in a rush. Not, not, a, not a lot. Yeah, but we are not. We are running late. But my because.
critical of the media, right? As the state's apparatus, but also maybe as an, an instrument of culture, maybe even a platform that represents the politics of the day, right? Um, and I do think that it's unfortunate that it works in the way that it does, that it privileges already privileged individuals. But I don't think that we should now not necessarily be insensitive, but I think it's a very complex argument. And I think there's a lot to interrogate in terms of, of, of privilege and in terms of these differences that exist even between black women. How do we make sure that as black women, we don't succumb to those politics of difference? And I'm not saying that we should ignore nuance. I'm saying that we should be aware of how they operate, but also how they can benefit us, right? And I'm looking at this list of names, and I'm sure that if she had given a different list of names, I wouldn't have known who she was speaking about. And obviously the message that she was trying to relay would then have been lost, right? And that's not to, I, I, I don't, I'm not saying that that's not problematic in itself, but we live in, in, in a world full of disparity and we live in a world where the, the attention is on two places, I can say. So it's Johannesburg and it's Cape Town. But also what I'm saying is that we need to use this as leverage that strengthens our movement as women, that's, that strengthens the feminist cause. So how do we rally around, not only maybe these women, but other women who haven't been represented, right? So how do we continue the conversation around those names who haven't um, um, been mentioned, as opposed to saying, well, those women haven't been mentioned, you get what I'm saying? And I don't, I'm not condoning it in, in any way, but I, I'm, I'm thinking how there are women who are vocal. I'm, I'm thinking recently of the woman who um, has been circulating on Twitter, right? The Zofa Cecilia. And I think that's a very powerful statement. So now the question for me, or rather the challenge is, how do we galvanize support around those women who are obviously from the margins, but who have been vocal, right? As opposed to saying, but. But sorry, also that's not necessarily true because I was quite deliberate about choosing these names. So Naledi Litova, that incident happened in the Free State and not a lot of people know about Naledi. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, when I think about Notolo Kakeka, um, yeah, Kakeka, I specifically put her in there because um, it was related to her being a lesbian and it happened in Google in a township. So I don't think that that's necessarily true. And also the other thing with, um, for example, Riva, I guess Garabo is kind of like out there. Um, but the thing with Riva also is that I also want to emphasize that we are speaking from a positionality of like being a black woman moving in space. But at the same time, there is something about being a woman and being vulnerable in the world that we all experience. So I was very um, deliberate about making sure that I'm including um, a woman who identified as a lesbian, Uyenene, simply because she's in the public imaginary right now, everyone's talking about her. Um, and I think that um, that is important to say what, is, what are people concerned about and what are people, what is kind of the thing that is triggering people's thoughts and feelings and emotions because a lot of people, the response to Uyen it was actually like anger, which we haven't seen uh, um, in a while, where usually when you hear about these cases, like, oh my gosh, it's so sad, um, I can't believe this happened, but there was a different kind of anger around Nene's death that I think we haven't seen in a long time. And so, yeah, I don't think that's necessarily true. Like, location-wise, where they're coming from, they're all very different.
and you think that he is a element to class, an element to people that are privileged that get talking about on the media. But what's of my concern is that these women are all considered beautiful. Mm -hmm. Why is it? Oh, the woman was so beautiful and she was killed. Yeah. So it doesn't mean yeah. that women that aren't beautiful, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So I, I, I think to see what she's trying to get at. That when you come from deep rural communities, the lives of women and the pain they go through is just not spoken about in the larger media of on media things that's going on. So I, I do I respect that you chose women that aren't necessarily mainstream, but I think we need to look at this thing, oh beautiful, but it was a beautiful child, it was a beautiful woman. Any child that gets on. It's, it's unacceptable. Any woman that is on, it's unacceptable. So, the construction of what we understand the representation of women and children, it's, and it was, I don't know, I was angry when I saw that this white child from Freedom Work was stolen and at the end of the day they found the child. What about all the other children that are getting stolen? I, 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 I'm from the Cape Town, so. I see these people from into Spain saying, oh, this child was stolen and they uh, grab these children from the school and they try to grab these children, but none of these things ever get into the media. And uh, uh, there is a class, there is a race, there is a, there's just certain people who are being privileged about the masses of other people that are being wronged. I, I think that it also points to what research we seek to do. And I think most of us are located in these urban areas uh, where there's high profile cases like this and we have access to them. But it also points to the kind of research that needs to be done in those places which are not accessible to us as urban academics. So there's a need, therefore, to go into those remote places, mm -hmm. to go into those villages, to go into those townships, and get, I think, uh, we will get a much more alarming picture mm -hmm. of what is happening there. And the number of lesbians that are gang raped and put to death, the number of very young infants that are raped because of superstitions, so many things. So we've also got to think about how do we relocate our research, and not um, and that's asking a lot because there's also all the practical aspects. Mm -hmm. How does somebody who's situated at this access somebody in Tohowondo, for example? So let us not be too critical about seeing this. It of of course raises the issue that there are only some people who are highlighted. In but we're all aware that behind these popular names are those invisible uh, children and women and gay people and lesbians who are oppressed in these brutal ways. So I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm saying maybe <laughs> that we need to spread out our wings as researchers. Mm -hmm. She, she, I mean, it's the same question. Maybe, maybe you want to respond to each in your own way. Yeah, so I definitely agree, but I think um, one of the reasons why also Quippy's story spoke to me is I think you mentioned it when you said how do we think a wo what do we think a woman looks like and so when we think about like gender-based violence there's an image that comes to mind and that is quote unquote the valid image and one of the things that i struggled with obviously was that um as a transgender woman there are also privileges that you have from a biological perspective of walking down the city that other women don't have and so that's why I think that the more 
firstly, like, allyship is important. Like, this idea of seeing ourselves as a collective, as vulnerable people. But also, when we begin to complicate what is a woman, what do they look like, what is their power, in what ways is violence um, being inflicted on them, that kind of hopefully, I don't know, yeah, so it's very difficult, basically. Um, so I'll ask both the right <laughs> I'll just ask one question that you can choose to answer in whichever way. Just listening to both, all three papers, what you're asking us to think and rethink is the ways in which we, we theorize violence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for, for both, for, for both two, your two papers, um, <clears throat> on the one hand, you get us to think about violence, but outside of the realm of the human, right? And, and, and so in getting us to, in, in theorizing post-human, you you, you're then asking us to think about what, what violence means um, in ways that perhaps we are not familiar with. And I, I suppose also in many ways also connects to the, the question that's being asked about all, all of that and the role that the media, so this is the role that the media, in, in some cases, that the media plays in hyping violence which attaches to particular stereotypes of what is considered beauty and what is, so that they can hide the, the issue. But then in all three, what I see as a thread is the way in which you're getting us to rethink violence in various ways. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps I would want to just listen to, especially the two of you, what you think uh, kind of more globally is the work that you're doing theoretically to get us to rethink violence, especially when you're asking us to not think about violence in the normative ways, but here as just duty, as, as, as reclaiming as agency. make 
those ongoing reflection and conversation more meaningful? Um, yeah, I guess I had to think really hard about your question, but I think it's, it's a really good question. I think when I was writing this paper, what I was thinking about specifically in writing about murder as an act of protest yeah. was the body as a site of oppression, but the body also as a site of resistance. Because the lady uses her body in a very physical way to kill her husband. So that's what I was thinking about. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say, but that's what, that's what I was thinking, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, thank you so much for your presentation.